by a candidate who will not ensure that government fulfills its obligation to protect life, they will not protect the rights to liberty or the pursuit of happiness either. The importance of this rally is that when candidates know that they are not alone when they stand up for protecting the right to life, when opponents know that pointing out a pro-life candidate's stand for life will result in the pro-life candidate receiving more than 50% of the vote, then resistance to pro-life candidates will cease. By getting out the truth and educating voters, we can change the environment. We can ensure that leaders are elected who will fulfill the role of government set by our founders to protect that inalienable right endowed by our creator, the right to life. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, at this time, I'd like to just take a, a side uh, step to the fact of we are in an election season. Uh, this, this fall, we have a very critical congressional election. One of the candidates is overtly pro-life, and one is uh, a rubber stamp voter for all pro-choice uh, liberal positions. Uh, neither one is here today. They were both invited. But uh, that doesn't stop us from discerning which candidate uh, is a pro-life candidate, which isn't. And I, I'm telling you, uh, this is a chance for us to send someone to Congress that is going to be uh, voting for our positions. But I'd like to say even more than that, beyond this election, next year is the off-year elections that Virginia has for its uh, state legislature. Ninety-five percent of all office holders in Northern Virginia are pro-choice. This has got to change. There is no reason for this ridiculous preponderance of pro-choice office holders in this area, which has thousands upon thousands of pro-life voters, but we just have to show up. In primaries and in the general election, the percentage of voters is minuscule. It is embarrassingly low. It would not take anything for our churches and our people and our voters to ouch uh, to show up more than the other side. We can elect pro-life office holders right here in Northern Virginia. It can be done. We just have to believe it can be done and make it happen. So I want you to know that the NOVA project, which is basically a, an attempt to uh, organize activists right here, like you, to take a look at our own backyard and keep working, because this is only the start. This is not just for this fall. We're looking ahead to next year and the state legislature, as well as just saving lives and getting the churches more on board, getting, just getting the excitement up and the fact that we can do this. We can end abortion now. All right, our next uh, speaker is... Um, a wonderful woman who has experienced the, the pain and agony of abortion herself and, and has spoken on many occasions about her story. Uh, she's here today with us, Andrea Pearson. Thank you. I'd like to thank um, all those who organized this uh, wonderful pro-life event and for giving me the opportunity here to speak to all you pro-life Virginians. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm here from Silent No More Awareness Campaign. The uh, campaign is an effort to make public aware of the devastation abortion brings to women, men, and their families through personal testimony. I have quietly been involved in the pro-life movement, um, done things sort of on the back, and about six years ago I decided to break my silence and publicly give my testimony of abortion. Um, not only for the pain and the suffering of abortion, but also about God's great love and mercy and forgiveness and to reveal the truth of abortion. I was 19 years old when I became pregnant to someone I had been dating for about a year. When I told him I was pregnant, he revealed to me that he didn't want anything to do with a baby. I was devastated. Too scared to tell my parents 
I turned to a local Planned Parenthood for help and advice. What Planned Parenthood did was take advantage of my distress. And I believed in what I know now were a web of lies. I left not with information and advice, but a quickly made appointment for an abortion, never being told of the consequences I would face. Within a couple days, the father and I were sitting in the waiting room at an abortion clinic. The procedure was very painful, and it felt exactly like was what was taking place my baby being ripped out from inside of me. And when it was complete, I was taken to a room among several other women lined up on their gurneys, some of them weeping, others just staring. As I sat there, great feelings of sadness, emptiness, and shame came over me. I kept thinking, what did I just do? What have I done? The weeks and months following my abortion, I would relive that procedure. I would vividly, and I still do remember, the sounds of the suction, the physical pain, and the other women's vacant stares. The impact of my decision and its consequences were starting to evolve. My relationship with the baby's father quickly dissolved, and I became depressed. Both my physical and emotional pain grew. Alcohol and drugs became my comfort and my escape from the pain. I developed a promiscuous lifestyle to experience the feeling of being wanted again. Yet deep inside, bitterness grew and I became indifferent toward men. I found myself growing distant to the ones who loved me the most and cared for me, my family and especially God. I lived in this darkness for several years. I became so self-destructive that my mother and sisters started traveling, visiting churches, asking priests and different clergy and prayer groups to pray for me. And at what I considered the lowest point of my life, lost, feeling there was nothing left, and as thoughts of suicide circled my mind, I knew I needed to find some kind of help. I decided to go home, and not the home of my parents, but to my Heavenly Father's house, where I ended up meeting a priest who entered the church as I sat there weeping. He would turn out to be my confessor and spiritual guide for my long journey out of darkness. God had truly sent me a gift. I have come to experience God's healing and forgiveness through various healing programs, and I have learned to forgive myself, and I reconnected with my faith. I am most grateful to my mother, sister, and all of those whom they asked to pray for me because God heard their voices and their prayers were answered. One of the most powerful weapons we have against this evil is prayer. It is needed now more than ever. It is something that every one of us can do. And when you pray, you need to pray for the mothers contemplating abortion, that they open their hearts to accept life. And for the mothers and fathers hurting from abortion, that they're open to receive counsel and the love and forgiveness of God. Pray for the abortionist, that they will come to realize the value of the lives they terminate and do so with love. Pray for the protection of the unborn babies threatened with imminent death. Pray for the priests and clergy that they take courage and preach and promote the whole pro-life message. We need to encourage them and stand with them. Pray for our leaders that their eyes and their hearts are opened and let it be known for those who continue to support and vote for candidates, persons, and programs that support abortion are simply making possible the deaths of millions of innocent human lives. We have a great opportunity coming up, and now is our time, and we know the tide is changing. And yes, we are Virginia and we are pro-life, and I will continue to speak out 